Now my pleasure to introduce Omer Shapira. Omer is a lead VR artist at NVIDIA. Previous to this, he was lead creative technologist at Fake Love, uh, a high-end creative technology agency uh, in New York City, doing um, advertising work in large-scale, complicated installations. Uh, Omer is um, a contributor to Open Frameworks and has contributed significantly to the Clouds documentary by James George, Jonathan Menard, and the Scatter Crew. Uh, and he is really a leading expert in virtual reality, in particular, the way it intersects with our, the way we use our bodies. And so I think what you'll see today in this workshop, which is entitled, um, uh, it's more than just shooting photons into your eyeballs, uh, or something to that effect. Um, uh, 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 Omer is going to remind us that we have other parts of our uh, sensory apparatus besides just our eyes and um, get us to feel uh, virtual realities in a lot of different ways. Uh, without further ado, may I please introduce Omer Shapira. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, there it is. Uh, so, my name is Omer. Um, I'm actually really, really excited to meet a lot of my heroes here. And also, it's one of the, it's one of the weird things that when you come to a uh, place like this, you see all the new people, thinking, oh, all the old guys failed because reasons. This is totally going to make it this time. VR is totally going to make it. And then the people who've tried it before come in and say, well, actually, we don't know and you don't know. And um, failure is so much more important. Um, so I, I really love uh, watching um, Brenda Laurel talk yesterday about uh, how much um, you know, we are making the same mistakes over and over again. Um, and hopefully, I can share just a bit of my mistakes in this talk, uh, and share some things I got right, um, and, uh, you know, get, get VR to be a little better for the next time we fail. <laughs> um, so, my talk is called, um, there's more than just, there's more to it than just show, shooting photons, shooting photons in your face. I'll try again. My talk is called, There's More To It Than Just Shoving Photons In Your Face. And um, I'll, I'll introduce myself briefly, what I did, uh, and then we can talk about um, what, what actually this means. Um, I started out being a filmmaker. I, I started working in television since I was like 15. I've been working in television for about a decade when I burned out completely and um, started studying math. And, while I enrolled to study math, and this, this is all in Israel, so it means I was a filmmaker in the army, filmmaker in all sorts of places. Um, and while I was studying math, actually, uh, the peak of my career, as far as television goes, um, arrived, and I, I hosted my own TV show, well, I co-hosted a TV show about uh, technology. And I, I had this realization about, like, you know, two years into doing that, that um, I'm just talking about other people's inventions, and this is not what I want the peak of my career to look like. Um, so I, I signed up for grad school, I went to NYU. Um, I went to a program called ITP, um, which is, uh, got a lot of people here, it stands for the Interactive Telecommunications Program. Um, who is that? <laughs> Who's laughing over there? <laughs> Um, and so uh, I started working on um, really elaborate, weird things. Um, one of them was this uh, four-dimensional video game. Um, I was really not interested in just making another hot take about tech. I really wanted to make things that explore how people think and about how people feel. Um, so this, this is a puzzle game that I, that I made. Uh, but I also um, started drifting away towards um, a lab that's just next door, that's led by Ken Perlin, um, who is in this conference, and he gave me an Oculus VK1 and said, what can you do with it? And these are the first things that I made. Um, so we, we started working on um, this motion tracked uh, experience that eventually took over an entire room. This is just, um, we see here is a, a guy, that's not me, wearing um, a few, a few motion trackers above uh, his head, and playing with uh, some controllers that we built custom-made, um, including haptic controllers. We had 
probably every haptic motor that you can find at the time. Um, and we just started experimenting with what, you know, what people feel and how people um, experience touching virtual objects. Um, and just before I could continue to, to do a PhD with him, I, I got snagged by Framestore, and I started working on some commercial projects. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about my personal art from now on because there's just way too much to talk about that's not that. Um, so I started working on, um, this is, what is this? Oh, this is, uh, this is a project for um, Marvel. We worked on um, a virtual reality version of uh, Iron Man's heads-up display. And that's, that's on the Gear Store, I think, or is it? I'm not sure. I think, I think it's on the Gear Store. Uh, so, I, and I started exploring what it looks like to actually build, you know, a real version of the Iron Man's um, heads-up display. Because the, the, um, the one in the film is way too saturated for an actual human brain to comprehend if, you're, if it's directly in your face. So we started doing some reductions. I worked on that. I worked on um, the VR version of Interstellar. Built some tools for that. Um, a little bit of graphics. Um, I did what is now considered the first advertising project that is room scale. Um, this is Meryl Trailscape. Uh, it's using the exact same techniques of uh, just a motion tracker in the room. Um, people can walk around, and you don't think this is special now, uh, but this is, was this was about what is it, a year before the Vive came out. So we did everything by ourselves, um, and this, this entailed, you know, building a motion tracking system. Connecting it to Unreal Engine, um, doing a lot of technical work to get it to update at around two milliseconds, and uh, making people feel natural when they walk around. And the really cool thing that we had there was that people could do this into the ground. And as they did that, they saw a bridge, and they saw what was below the bridge. And so a lot of people just hung out the entire time while looking down. It was really cool. Um, so after that, I, I was a bit saturated from the big advertising world to a smaller company called Fake Love. I did a few projects. This one was for Google. This one was for a film called Carol. Uh, and I worked on another project that was um, a four-person experience. Um, that's, that, this was still before the Vive came out. A four-person experience. Um, they're all in the same space, and they're all solving a puzzle to make this um, large dancer made of sand dance for them. Um, and I was getting more and more interested in what makes people feel the scale there. Um, so, you know, I did a lot of experiments in trying different sizes of a human compared to this enormous beast of a dancer. Um, and I started realizing that uh, really small cues can get a lot of difference from like the size of how you perceive what, what, what size sand is to the entire dancer. Um, and around that time I got um, snagged by NVIDIA because they showed me this thing. Um, this is a fun house. Um, it's, it's been developed before I showed up at NVIDIA. Um, and the most important thing you can say about it is that it's really fun. <laughs> It really is. Like, um, as soon as I grab the controllers to play with it, I notice, whoa, this is really realistic. I, I'm feeling a lot of things that I didn't feel in previous VR experiences. And I'm trying to break this down still, because they got a lot of things right there. Among the things that they got right is there's this fluid that you shoot at clowns is really reactive. And you can cross the streams, and you can, you know, you can shoot goo at your feet. And, um, stop snickering. Um, and you, so you can, do, you can do a lot of things that, that, you know, just make you feel like you are there and you are playing with the bits. And this is, this is pretty much everything I've researched. Everything I've researched, but I see other people have done it alongside me. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm there. Um, and what I'm going to talk about right now is how to do some of those things, or at least what you should care about when you're designing some of those things. It's hard. Um, one of the reasons that it's hard is that just to get to virtual reality, even now when we have you know game engines by our side, there's a whole lot of things that you should learn just to get to the point that you can actually put photons in people's faces. Um, this was my book stack a while ago, 
it's no longer my book stack because that's grown about like threefold, I think. Uh, mostly books in neuroscience now. Um, but yeah, you really should be starting from the beginning, which is, you know, learning how to code and then learning how to design, but also learning about optics and how eyes work. And, you know, after you've learned how eyes work, you really should learn how the brain is a sense integrator. So you have to go through all these processes until you get to the point that you can actually understand what it is that we're doing when we're experiencing reality. And um, if there's one thing that I can give you, you know, as homework from this entire talk, is actually go and, just go and buy this book. It's by Jennifer Grote. Um, she's a professor at Duke, and this explains most of what we know currently about how the brain perceives space. But you won't, you won't fall asleep reading this book. It's really good. Um, so let's talk about what what making VR is, what we know about making VR, and how that, how that differs from everything else that, that we know so far. So, this is what I hear a lot from people. You know, virtual reality, oh, it's like, yeah, it's like VFX. I worked in a VFX studio. I worked in VFX studios um, for many years. Before, before moving to the United States, I worked in VFX studios. A lot of people think, oh, this is like that, because I, I know graphics, so I can definitely do this. Um, filmmakers tend to think, oh, VR is just cameras, but all around you. Um, and I, I typically get to long discussions with those people uh, where my main point is, stop it. Uh, VR is not like any of those things, but it's not like any of those things, not just because you know there's more stuff going on. It's fundamentally different from film. It's fundamentally different from games. Here's an easy mnemonic to why VR is different from all of them. VR is not a medium. Um, if you think about um, medium, you know, you can say a headset is a medium, right? But, like, are we really at the point that we've made enough headsets to call it a uniform medium? Like, can I take something from one headset to another? In this particular case, you know, as media is right now, maybe. Um, think about was the guy, Russell Brand, I think, that said um, that digital media survives uh, forever or five years, whichever is shorter. Um, uh, so, or whichever is longer, that's it. Um, so, yeah, like, we, we, don't, we can't really call it a medium for practical reasons, but also for theoretical reasons. And my way of thinking about it is that virtual reality is really just an achieved result, right? You know, if we've done all the things correctly, in the right order, and we've taken over all our senses, then yeah, we're, we've achieved virtual reality. Um, here's my, here's the guy that agrees with me. So if anyone thinks that, if, if anyone starts talking to you about like, wait, the virtual reality, I can make film um, go around your head, it's really immersive, just ask them what are words anyway? Because <laughs> immersive does not mean I am, it is all around me, it's attacking me. That means you're just shooting photons in people's faces. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's actually break down what it is. And I want to show you my favorite virtual reality device. Um, this is a device called InTouch. It was made by Hiroshi Ishii uh, around 1998. Uh, I'm going to turn the volume down for this one. So Hiroshi Ishii is now in the media lab. He made this device where um, you had three rollers made of wood. You're holding it in one place. There's another person like, interacting with them on the, on the other side. He planned for it to be um, his mother uh, that, that's in, in Japan while well, he's in Boston, um, playing with that on the other side. If you close your eyes and you have nothing else in the group, this is your only sensory input as far as you know, is this virtual reality? I think it is. I think this is pretty and this is sufficient as virtual reality, right? This is not anything where you say, well, the experience is not full enough for me, I can't really feel this. Okay, you can add a telephone, but you are with the person in the room because you're both touching this, and this is the granularity that you have for this device. It is not only, it is not only sufficient, it's complete, right? You are being, all the senses that are relevant to you are being taken over while you're doing this. So I think this is the best virtual reality device that I've seen so far because for the most part, the rest of our sensory inputs are not being fulfilled as much. Yeah, I, I don't remember why I had this slide, but just enjoy it. Um, 
Oh yeah, no, I actually had a point here, but, because you can actually do this. Um, you can actually have an immersive experience with significantly less sensory inputs than, than what is available currently. We are racing to the bottom as far as, uh, you know, pixel pitch goes. The difference, like the, the, um, the edges between pixels in our displays are getting really, really thin. We're cramming a lot more pixels. But this is not me saying, Michael Abrash of Oculus Research says that you need about 24 by 24K, which is a lot more than what we have currently, to cover the entire field of human vision. But as we get to understand vision more and more, we understand that actually, wait, you don't need all of that together. You can render only the important parts straight ahead of us. And we're going to get there, actually. Let's get, let's get there now. What's reality anyway? So, let's talk about the things on a daily basis that, makes us, that make us feel in a certain place. When you're dreaming, as far as you're concerned, is it reality? Come on, interact. Yeah, right? Right? When you, have it, when you have all of your sensory inputs, as far as you're concerned for that moment being taken over, it's reality for you. And then you get to the point where you're like, no, wait, this was not reality. Have you ever had the moment in virtual reality, the way we know it today, where you snapped out of it and you said, oh no, wait, I have to convince myself that that was not reality? Not really, right? So we're not there yet, but we can get there if we just follow the rules of taking the correct sensory inputs. So let's talk about it. This is our visual system. These are actually, this is the inside of our eyes. A um, few stats about the eyes, because that's the easiest way to start this. Um, so we can see, we can see color, but only when it's really bright. When it gets darker, we become adaptive, and our sensory inputs that only sort of see a narrow band of light become activated, and even though we don't think we're seeing black and white, we're really seeing one color. But when it gets really bright, and that's what we call light adaptive, we can see multiple colors, about three. Um, uh, when I say about three, it's because most humans have different cutoffs between where our eyes can see. So we can see multiple colors when it's bright enough. And um, you know, some people that have color blindness have two ranges that are very, very close together, but their nerves are still working fine. When you're blind, you can see at the edges of your retina, you still see a bit of color. You still gather some of that image, but you're not seeing the main parts of, of your um, visual cortex are not being activated. The main part, by the way, is macula. It's only about two, it's a small cone around the center of our eye. It's only about two degrees. So if you look straight ahead and try to figure out something that's over there, you can do this with me. Look straight ahead and put your, uh, your finger over here. Okay? Try to move it to see where it disappears while looking straight ahead. Everybody got it? Think about the amount of information that's coming there. It's really, really tiny. Our brain has to process it because most of what we see is directly over here. Most of the nerves, and I, I don't have a percentage on this, is at the, the center two degrees of what we see. Some animals have a different ratio. We have 2%. We have a blind spot in our eye, right where the nerves come in to, uh, the, to our visual cortex. We don't have any receptors. Octopi have receptors there, we don't. So if we move a piece of paper around our face, there is a certain point where it will disappear, and we won't notice it that it disappears. And I can give you an exercise on that later, but we have a limited amount of time. We won't notice it disappears, but our brain still fills in that bit of the image, right? So our brain is doing a lot more of the visual processing than what we are aware of on a daily basis. This is really important because if you actually only need what's straight in front of you, and you need very, very little information here, you can't see how many fingers you're holding up, right? Can you? Try it. Try it with a friend. Try to see if they're holding up their middle finger. <laughs> Um, so, when you're doing that, you, you actually realize that, you know, maybe we don't need that many pixels. Maybe we can do with less. And this is, this is by the way, an industry term that's now called foveated rendering. It means that it's following our phobia, right? We, we are only rendering a large amount of inf information where we need a large amount of information. 
right? We're following the cues that our senses are giving us for how much we actually need to display to a user to achieve virtual reality. This is the men's shrimp. Men's shrimps have 16 color receptors, not three. Those color receptors, as far as the brain collects them, are pretty much binary. We can look at, um, I'm doing this all from memory, so forgive me. Um, those color receptors are pretty much binary, so they can either tell on or off for each color, but they have 16 different colors. So if we were to create a headset for a mantis shrimp, we would need to accommodate for their senses. That's, they have different receptors altogether. They have about five to 10 degrees in a field of vision. Their eyes move independently. So they can scan the room. We have about 220 degrees of our field of vision. If our head is fixed, we can't look over there. We can do this, right? We can take our eyes over here, we can saccade over there, and we can gather new information. But we can't just move our eyes independently. So if we want to build a headset for managed trends, we would have to do something very differently. So this is important here. We're not, when we're building virtual reality headsets, we're not building something to recreate optics as they are. We're building something for the human senses. Let's talk about more systems and then we can have um, coverage for the rest. Then there's our auditory system, right? So each of our ears can tell basically two things. They can tell the amplitude of something and they can tell the frequency of something if you're taking this over time. This is something really special, actually. The fact that we can tell frequencies, mathematically, it's really complicated. Think about it. This is a Fourier coefficient that we're deriving from just listening to something, right? We are telling how fast something is moving because some ears, uh, with some hairs in our ears, which you see here, are vibrating at that speed, and our brain is integrating that into a frequency. This is something totally non trivial the brain is doing to do this. When you have two ears doing this, we can actually tell the amplitude difference between them, so we know if something is stronger to this direction or something is stronger to this direction. But we can also tell the time delay between them, which means our brain has memory applied to hearing. Think about it for a second. We can tell if a snap happened here, and we then heard it here. Our, main, our brain has a small amount of memory to keep that. And we can also tell phase differences, which is really important because if you listen to Beatles records from the 60s, but like any psychedelia record essentially from the 60s, you'll, you'll see that it was a really easy trick for audio engineers to flip, flip the face because they had no delay, and then you, then you, you hear like this artificial stereo effect. Um, but this is something that we use for, for example, deriving a Doppler effect. We want to know if a car is passing by. Well, it wasn't built for cars, but we want to we know if something is passing by. So we can use our ability to tell face and thus construct an image of our space, right? So, by the way, when, you're, when, you're, when I'm saying visual system, an auditory system, what I really mean when I say visual is totally different from the visual system because we treat visual arts as our ability to construct space, right? But the way I read this, this system is also pretty visual. I can construct space with it. And you know this, like any, any blind person will know that they can construct space by walking somewhere with their eyes closed because it doesn't matter to them. Well, to a certain degree, we can talk about that later. But we can construct a space only using our hearing the same way that we can construct a space only using our vision. There's also, by the way, um, some abilities of the eyes that we haven't discussed, but I'm gonna get to them later. So the same way that we get our auditory system activated, we get our vestibular system activated. This is a very slow system. It fires at a lower rate. And you basically only notice it when something goes wrong. Did anybody ever get seasick? Did anybody ever get simulation sick? Does anybody not know the difference? Come on. Does anybody know the difference? Okay, you're all liars. <laughs> Um, let's start with the easy one. Seasickness. Your eyes see something, they tell you it's fine. Your inner ear feels something, 
that tells you the opposite. The reaction is to panic, right? Well, you have other ways of telling that something is wrong and that it's, it's balancing. I'm giving the eyes as an example. Yeah, it's, uh, the, 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 the comment was you don't need to use your eyes to be seasick, and that's correct. Simulation sickness is the opposite, right? Your eyes or other inputs see something that seems to be say, telling you to panic. But the rest of your body, or in this case your vestibular system, is telling you that everything is fine. And you still have this, this difference. By the way, shout out to uh, Daniel Rager, who's a student here, uh, a PhD student for neuroscience, um, that fact check me on these ones. Um, so, the vestibular system tells you whether or not you are wrong, but it also can be used in your favor, right? Has anyone ever seen the effect of electrogalvanic stimulation? Okay, more people should chalk themselves in this room. <laughs> you can fool the vestibular system, literally by passing electricity through the area around your ears. And by training your brain to ignore it, or by training your brain to treat those signals differently, you can affect your balance. And you can see videos of people literally being remote controlled by signals to their vestibular system. This is important because individually those senses don't do a lot, right? I can't really construct an image of the world from my vestibular system, yet it's really important for me when I'm doing virtual reality. You think this is enough to construct a space, but this is a pigeon, and pigeons have magnetoreception, right? They can feel where true north is, or magnetic north, sorry, not true north. Um, so, if a pigeon were to enter a space and you would do the best audio effects to tell it, um, this is exactly where you're standing, and you would give it the best visual effects to tell it exactly where, where it's standing, the pigeon would still have a hard time believing it's in virtual reality because it knows where magnetic north is. By the way, so do headsets, which is a problem to anyone who's ever built an installation. Um, headsets uh, in this generation have a magnetometer that can sort of say where, true north is, where magnetic north is and uh, correct for yaw. Um, but if you fool it with a magnet, you'll see a lot of offsets, and they go completely wrong. And you'll notice this when you go to places where there's a lot of iron, and you try to start an installation. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, okay, so let's keep going. Then we have our haptic systems. Our haptic systems are really complicated, actually, and none of us are, have, have been able to go all the way through them. They, we have about four different sensors here. They're, um, they're called, um, there's, there's Merkel's discs, and there's my, Meisner's uh, corpuscles, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, that's scientific talk for stuff that's in your hand. Um, and so we can tell a lot of different things from the surface of our skin, right? We can tell when we are being pinpricked, and that's completely different from picking up a pitchfork and telling it frequencies vib vibrating, and we can tell that. We have the ability to sense vibrations up to about a kilohertz. I mean, around 500 hertz it dies out, but about a kilohertz we can still feel it, which is amazing, but those are really blunt in our hand. Some areas, we have a lot more of them, but our sensors that way are not spread out equally. So when you try to think about a way to stimulate someone using only the haptic system, you have to do a lot more thinking about where you want to place the specific sensations that go through their hands. And that includes many things, right? Those sensors also include our thermoception, our ability to tell what temperature thing, uh, something is, our ability to tell whether or not we're experiencing pain. And those all have different precedents because some of those signals, as they saturate, they get faster to our brain. And this is true for all our system, by the way. If we shine a brighter light in one of our eyes, those signals will travel faster to our brain than the, the, than the dimmer light, just because there's more electricity involved. And the brain does not like surprises, right? When we get two signals that conflict, the brain will give them precedence. That's um, pretty much, I'm, I'm simplifying this, but that's pretty much the, uh, sorry, the consensus in the neuroscience community. It's called the Bayesian brain hypothesis. 
If I'm wrong about this, by the way, uh, please correct me. Um, okay, so after that, we also have the kinesthetic sensors, which are different from, uh, from the haptic sensors. Does anybody know the difference between kinesthetics and haptics? Okay, two people. Thank you, two people. This is a microscope image of our muscle spindles. Muscles, our muscles are essentially able to contract because of uh, electricity, able to exert some force, but they are just viscous membranes. I'm sorry, English is not my native language, so I'll pause every time now and then. They're just vi viscous membranes, and inside them, we have nerves that can tell how far they're being stretched and how, how far they're being contracted. And these work really well for our body. We can tell where our hand is, we can tell how far it's moved from, from our body. And I'd like everybody to get up for a second and try this out. Take about an arm's distance away from all your mates. I want you to do several things after me. Close your eyes and touch your nose. Open your eyes. Who didn't make it? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, let's try another thing. What? I didn't do it. the middle of my cheek. You touched the middle of your chin. See a doctor. What? Okay. Um, so one person didn't do it. You have bad data, I think. Um, so let's so let's do something else. Let's try now. Let's try now. Imagining a Rubik's cube. Okay. Don't do it yet. Imagine a Rubik's cube. Imagine its size. As you close your eyes, I want you to hold the Rubik's cube and then twist it. Close your eyes. Hold the Rubik's cube. Twist it and open your eyes to look at your hands. All of you were able to understand the shape of the Rubik's Cube, to know where your muscles are positioned, right, how much they're stretched, without any input from anywhere in the outside world, and twist the Rubik's Cube as in put your fans in position that the Rubik's Cube should be when it's twisted. And you've done all of this without looking at your hands, without any input, and without any input from your skin. This is just your muscles moving, and the feedback that you're getting from your muscles to your brain, just about tension. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, this is because the brain is a sense integrator. We get signals from all over our body, and our brain has to get a composite image of those signals, and it then has to decide what state of reality we are in. Let's try something else. While you're sat down, Take your two fingers and try to touch behind your back. How many people failed on the first go? I did, for sure. Let's talk about why. This is not a natural state for our muscles to be in. I would say that this is hard for most people to do. It gets even harder when they go over here. The stretch in our muscles makes the muscles saturate a bit. Sorry, the nerves saturate a bit. Which means we don't get as much clarity in our signal. We don't know this range of our sensory input. And we can't really decipher a position from it. So it's not perfect everywhere. But in general, we can fool the brain in many other ways. Let's look at one of them. This is a McGurk effect, and I'm going to let BBC explain that better than I can. The McGurk effect shows us that what we hear may not always be the truth. But it also helps us to understand what happens when our senses conflict. When the brain had... Okay, so what happened here was that... I'm going to go away from the slide, I'm sorry. This is too much for me. This is too much for my visual system. Um... What had happened was someone was always saying ba there, but for a bit you saw someone saying fa. And when you looked at it, the entire time, it was still playing ba. 
but you saw someone's lips moving, and you deciphered it in a different way. This is a result of our brain integrating the senses, integrating with memory as well, and deciding on what's the easiest path for it to go. Because the brain doesn't like surprises, as I said. So it tries to tell us as much as it can where there are no surprises. But we have to work really hard to fool the brain to make sure that, they understand that, that the brain understands that there's a surprise. In this case, it's really easy to fool the brain to thinking there's no surprise. No, this is reality. It's just different than what you thought. Brain fuses low level signals. Uh, sorry. The brain fuses low level signals. The thing that you saw earlier with stretching the hands, putting them on your nose, this is a composite image of our body that the brain has all the time. It's storing all the time. And it knows where you're standing. If you're standing like this, with your eyes closed, you know that you were standing like this. This is way more important to your image of your body than what you can do in current virtual reality. Proprioception is so good in telling us where we are at that we can do this with, all, with the rest of the signals from our body shut down completely. We can tell our body position all the time. Not only that, we can, only use, it, we can use it for motion planning. If I don't see my phone, because it's behind my hat. I can still reach for it. I know exactly how to plan the motion of my hand, reaching for the hat, reaching for the, the phone behind the hat. That's really important, because I know all of my flexing, and I've already planned the motion, because I know exactly what feedback I'm supposed to get by the time my hand reaches this point. This is so important for virtual reality, because if we have an object in space, we do not need to see our hand in order to reach for that object. We can plan reaching for the object and do it without any visual input. And then just get a small signal at the end. Yeah, you can reach the object. That's cool. Am I still on the slide? Yeah, yeah. Um, and more than that, we can, you know, we can tell where things are around our body, right? Everybody reach for their cell phone. Don't, put, don't take it out, just reach for your cell phone without looking at it. Who didn't make it? One person. Cool. <laughs> right, so proprioception is so important. We can tell stuff that's around us. So imagine this, I am creating a virtual reality environment. I don't have enough pixels to render all of my pens. But I do have enough room around my body. So I can pull some pen out of my pocket, it's there. I can have an entire inventory, I can have the room that I want to go to in my back pocket. In fact, one of the cool things that I saw in NVIDIA, which made me really realize that they know what they're doing, was that you could pull arrows to shoot something from behind your back, and you knew how to do that. So as soon as someone, without any visual aid, pulled the hand behind their back, it got an arrow. That's really a good use of as little pixels as possible. You don't need your eyes for this. In fact, the best exercise to think about visual virtual reality is to try doing that without rendering at all, right? How can you let people know about space if they know nothing from the visual input? Because if they know nothing from the visual input, you're really thinking about, well, let's add one cube there and see what they do with one cube. And that's really helpful, right? So. Let's talk about other ways in which the brain is completely fucking us over. Oh yeah, um, so we keep getting feedback from our brain on how to correct course, right? You know, if we're walking in a room, then we, can't, we have to look at some symbols, some signals around the room to tell us where we are. So I'm walking like this, I can be doing it with my eyes closed and I'll divert for a bit because I no longer have input. And this is really important because we can use this on a daily basis to make people move around better in virtual spaces, but we can also fool them and make them move around worse. This is an experiment conducted in the UK, I believe. Um, there's some people uh, with GPS sensors on them, and they were all told to walk straight. 
and the day, that day there was no sun out in the sky. So one guy got it almost right and just walked backwards. <laughs> but most of them failed. They started walking in circles because they had no external input to tell them where to, where to walk. They were walking straight as far as they're concerned, but there's small noise introduced in the system. And the noise may come from the fact that they're walking on a mountain, so they're not walking straight all the time. Or that, you know, there's a rock, or whatever. Their balance changed slightly, so they correct the course. They're not walking on trails, none of that. They just decided in an open field to change course. They decided that not one time, not in one period. They decided that continuously. They were just not walking straight. And this is important because you can use that ability of a human to readapt to new realities. And think about it, it's an ability. We, don't, we do not have the ability to tell what something is straight, what something straight is. We're built of pretty noisy, uh, pretty noisy systems. All of our cells are just, we're just a combination of cells and electricity moving through us, and this, this signal is pretty noisy. So we can't tell what real reality is, but we can tell how to correct course for as much reality as we can deal with. And we can use that, and people are using that to do something called redirected walking. In redirected walking, you can give a different signal to the person walking straight to how reality has changed according to their step. Right? So if I walk one step and I'm walking this way, I'm good with that because reality has kept walking, showing me that I walked straight. But what if I walk this way and reality shows me that I'm walking, that I'm walking this way? I will end up walking this way. And you can do this, and um, there are at least two people here from Microsoft uh, working with a person who has proven to many people that you can do this. Uh, that, that person is Mark Golas, and he's published a bunch of papers on redirected walking. You can find them all online. We don't need visual input, by the way, to do this. Because we correct course with everything we have. When blind people correct course, what they have? Well, they have some kinesthetic input because they're walking with a cane, so they can push it into things and they feel resistance. And then they can track that resistance over time. They have their ears. Um, they have some other things that are not really explored by science and really should be explored more, but VR is, is helping with that a lot. They can do this. And they're not judging reality because reality, as far as we're concerned, does not exist. We have our senses, that's the only thing we have to survive. And our senses are built in such a way that will help us survive the most extreme conditions that they can help us do. And that's not necessarily being accurate measurements of reality. That's being given precedence to the most important things that are happening to us. So if there's a predator somewhere, it's much more important for us to get the predator first and not know if we're exactly level, right? So it's more important for us to keep track of that, which is why we can fool people. Because we can, keep them more, we can give them more immediate signals. This is the other point that I wanted to make about this. We can always give less data to the brain. If you don't have sound, if you're walking with earplugs on, all you have to do to make sure that you're walking in a straight direction is using your eyes. If you're in a club, and sound is coming from all around you, and sound is generally saturated, you don't know where, where straight is. If you close your eyes or put flickering on, you're pretty much saturating all your senses at the same time, and you lose track of where the DJ booth is. And this is really important. We can use this. We, ha we have daily proof that that exists. Who doesn't know this life? Okay, thank you. Nope. <laughs> Lucky. Okay, this is, this is a really important like, mo moment in time where we keep getting evidence that this happens. I love this quote by Reagan Wald. If your brain, if you can't eat a dress, and the dress can't eat you, the brain did not evolve to give a fuck about its color. This is so important, right? We have preference to what our brain signals us. And in this case, of this dress. All of these images are correct. We are judging for each one of these instances what our brain can judge, given the data. This is a limited gamut projector, and we have a limited gamut image going through the projector. 
And for each one, we have a different white balance. We see a different thing as white, and we see a different thing as black. So obviously, we will use the best judgment that we have to, not, to, to understand what the color of the dress is. I think this is fantastic, because that means that you can do so much with the relative judgment. And this has nothing to do with virtual reality. This could be done in real reality, which is kind of cool. So just before we go on to our exercise, um, let's talk about sickness. So, why do we get sick? I can tell you that um, for the first few weeks that I was developing VR at Ken Perlin's lab, I can, um, I was skipping lunches. This was the first time that, um, it was the first time that I, I, uh, I've ever been working with a game engine. It's also the first time that, it's the first time that I've ever thought of quaternions. And uh, if anyone has ever gone through that process, it means that if you get something wrong, when you turn your head this way, reality goes this way. That's really confusing. And so, um, you end up skipping a lot of lunches. <laughs> it becomes really bad. The reason it becomes bad is because our brain does not like surprises. Right? It will give precedence to surprises. It will make you feel bad because of surprises. It will do, activate every sense that we have in our body to make sure that you understand that this is not the way reality should be according to what we know. We have a bunch of frame of reference like, you know, the vestibular system. We change it a bit. We take someone going this way when they think they should be going that way. The brain will react. Our brain really hates being asked what to do. So, thank you, one person. Um, so when you're building a virtual reality experience, and you have one thing that reality tells you, another thing that person getting, is getting in their eyes, they will either accept the difference or completely reject it. And you have to explore that line. Sometimes it works. So for example, I know that for me, I can't tell where I'm walking straight. Most people that I know can't. Scientifically, I don't know. I haven't read enough papers on it. But I found that redirected walking generally works, so I can take people that way. I can also sort of manipulate where people's hand is in the centimeter degree, you know, around the center of their field of vision. I can definitely manipulate it more here, because we, as I've just shown you, cannot reach for this point with the same accuracy that we reach for this point. So I can manipulate that more. But if I go too extreme, or if I do the, it's the wrong thing, then I'm definitely introducing a dilemma to the brain in the way that they, they, the brain doesn't like. So let's talk about building virtual reality using only sensory input in the very abstract sense. Whenever you're looking at virtual reality in recent years, you're talking about concentric circles, like, you know, there's a lot of people have the, that have those in the slides. I like this approach because um, it resonates with a lot of things that we do already in game design. We talk about levels of detail, and when we talk about level, of, level, 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 when we talk about levels of detail in virtual reality, we're not talking about just levels of detail of rendering. We're also talking about levels of detail of interaction. If I can reach for my phone, I know, and I know exactly where it is. And I also know that I can scratch my foot or my ankle, and I know exactly the sensation that I should feel. This gives me a signal that my body is essentially the most granular part of virtual reality that I should be testing for. So everything that I'm doing when designing is around the fact that this is the most granular area. This is also the most alarming area, because if you see a predator over here, you're done. You, all of your uh, fight or flight, or flight instincts activate immediately. And this is true for all animals, right? Like, I mean, cats. Not great with computers. Not amazing writers. Definitely know where a predator is. Put a cucumber behind a cat. Is it, did anybody not see the videos of a cucumber behind the cat? Okay, if, like, just Google 
cat cucumber when you're out of here, or right now if you don't care. Um, what happens there is you see that the, they, put, they put a cucumber behind a cat, and as soon as the cat turns around, just when it's at the edge of their field of vision, they immediately jump. This activates all of their fight or flight um, instincts pretty much right away. Right? So when we're designing for an area that's around our body, we're pretty much designing for panic mode. So we better be really careful for what we put next to our body. Then there's near, right? So I consider near anything I can walk to, whereas here is anything I can reach for, right? Anything I can reach for, I will assign precedence in my brain because I know that I want to reach for it. I, can, I know that I can reach for me, pretty much. <laughs> so when we're designing menus, we better design them carefully around the near area. And it was almost time, so uh, I'm going to go a little quicker. Um, so, when we're talking about FAR, the basic way I like to treat FAR is stuff that can't eat me, pretty much. If I don't need to care about FAR, then I can just put, you know, the easiest thing for me as an artist is just to put background there. So all my areas of interaction is stuff that I can interact with and will interact with, stuff that I might possibly want to interact with, and stuff that I don't need to care about. These are the three levels of interaction that I, that I want to introduce. But there's also, for the same reasons, the, there are, these are the regions that we map while, while walking around an experience. If I have something in the here region, just grab it. If so, I have something in the near region, I should be aware of it. If I have something in the far region, like that exit sign, I might be aware of it, I might not, I don't care. We can talk about perspective a little bit. A lot of people will start designing in empty spaces. I'm really against that because empty spaces are already a prejudgment. No empty space we have is an ideal empty space. We already have sensory input when we're looking in an empty space. White room is still a lot of input. Black room, still some input. We see corners. Empty spaces also mean that there's ambient sound. So instead of designing for complete empty spaces, I will design with a certain spatial cue in mind. I want to put perspective in the room. So when you're putting stuff in VR, the most natural thing is to start with a piece of paper. Right? Start with a piece of paper. You can explore the edge of the paper. These are two vanishing points already because you can start reading and you don't see the entire page. You can start reading that way and you don't see the entire page. So you have two vanishing points already. It's easier to start with at least one vanishing point so you can read the space a little bit. Don't assume that empty, uh, starting with empty spaces is non-judgmental. This is another uh, example of an immediate vanishing point. This is E-Valkyrie. I love this game. I think what's cool about it is the fact that even though it's a very fast-paced game, and you can look around you, whenever you're feeling sick, you can look straight ahead, and it's as if you're in a car. And we don't get sick really easily in cars if we're driving, even though they're, they're moving around really quickly for us. So I'm going to end with this one thing. If you want to talk about interaction design in VR, you should really think like a cave dweller. Don't think about any modern digital tools that you have. Think about the most basic things. Now, if you reach in your gift bags, you'll notice this blindfold. And we have more back there. We have more back there. We also have some of the other A's that you can use after, this, after the keynote, actually, because after me comes by heart with a vengeance. Um, to explain a little bit more. Um, so you can, you can practice this. This is how I really design. When I'm trying to imagine a menu, I have a friend with me doing this near the edge of the stage is not smart. I put the blindfold on and I just point at stuff. Normally I also have a laser pointer, but I don't exactly know where I'm pointing with the laser pointer, so I'd rather use my finger. And I'm going to say, sorry, I'm going to say, I, ha I want exactly 
one step away from me, I want this menu over here. I want the play button, or rather, I want, I want the telephone right here. And here I have the sofa, right? It's, it's, it's about here, it's, it's yay high. Um, it's about one, two, long. Right? So this is the sofa for me. And I'll put a table right here. And someone will go with a post-it note that you have there as well. And they will place post-it notes at the place that I'm, that, that I'm placing objects. And I will do this, not for a second, but for like 15 minutes. Just walk around and imagine where stuff is. Because my proprioception helps me so much more than any other sense that I can experience with VR. I know exactly where my body is and I know exactly where I can reach. Which is why there is no better judgment for me about the ground truth of where I place objects. Anything that you put in virtual reality that is not the ground truth for your proprioception will be a dilemma for your brain. So it's much easier to start with nothing than to start with something judgmental. You can all go and do this exercise. I recommend that you do it with a friend. Use this piece of paper that you have over there as well. You can write down, you can describe the space, you have some Sharpies so you can do it in different colors, and just leave post-it notes around the room. When you open your eyes, you'll have something that you have built that is correct to your senses. And it doesn't matter how much you will work on designing that in CAD. The ground truth will always be what you've designed with your eyes closed. That's it for me. Thanks very much.